activism in the 60s, uh, and here we're speaking mostly of the late 60s, not the civil rights movement, uh, did have a lasting effect in just generally civilizing the society. So uh, women's rights, uh, gay rights, environmental concerns, uh, opposition to aggression, uh, lots of things have changed. This was a time when the new left was exploding. Anti-Stalinist ideas were coming up. New ideas about libertarianism and counterculture and revolution, and plus sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You throw it all in, it was a dynamic mixture and very, very exciting times. Black Panther movement, the civil rights movement, it was all over the newspapers and media. And the Panthers were very seductive. You know, they wore leather jackets and berets and they took on the American state head on. There was a generation that grew up watching civil rights demonstrations and watching people peacefully demonstrating being brutalized, being beat up, being shot because they are protesting nonviolently for civil rights. And that angered a lot of people. In 1971, I opened the first refuge in the world. And for the first four years, I ran it on the grounds of generational family uh, violence, which needed therapeutic intervention, which I created a model. When I first began to take in mothers and kids, police could do nothing. It was called the domestic. They had no power to intervene behind a closed door. Everybody knew that was the awful thing. It was the unsaid, but everybody knew. I could never get a penny from the government. So what we did is we became the biggest squatting agency in England. So we became a very frightening for the establishment because we were completely anarchic. The threat of the bringing over of the US cruise missiles was very real. Um, I, I started to get involved. I'd been involved, but sort of sitting comfortably talking about the issues. But I'd started to think, well, I have to get out on the street, as it were. Unlike many subsequent LGBT organizations, the Gay Liberation Front was not obsessed with equality. We didn't want to be equal within an unjust, flawed society. We wanted to change society for the betterment of all. And that meant linking up with the women's liberation movement, the black liberation movement, and the movement of working class people for greater social justice. We wanted to be free of being treated as second class citizens, as different, as exotic, as not deserving, as being immigrants. So that would motivate you to organise, because you couldn't survive on your own. There had been a big technical change in print production. Um, offset Litho was now widely available and the beginning of computer typesetting. And that, alongside a huge rise in political action, meant that it was much easier to produce media. And Spare Rib really grew out of the kind of anger of women who had been involved in the left press and felt that their voices were not being heard. And there was the event in Paris, there was the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, all these events were happening in, in the 60s. Um, so I started working with news images at that time and uh, wanted to create an art that wasn't just separate from what was going on in the world. In my work, I put the victim and the oppressor in the same picture. Because in the press, what you get, you get advertising, you get pictures of wars, and then you get leaders over here. With montage, you can bring those things together. So we were very inspired by the liberation struggles in Africa and the freedom movements. We were tremendously inspired by the National Liberation Front in Vietnam. The biggest thing then was the Vietnam War. And then the demonstration started. Then it was your first introduction to a policeman kicking you in the fucking stomach or something. That's how it all grew, right across the world in a sense, because there was so much going on everywhere. It did change my life because I got involved with a whole range of things which I'd never been, you know, confronting police and being deported in prison car vans and going to prison, you know, and sitting in court and things. People say, well, you know, you've been campaigning and doing all this stuff for 45 years and everything's got shittier and shittier, you know. <laughs> and of course the world has got worse, the oppression has got worse and the silencing of people has got worse. But it's still important to make radical, critical work. It's, it's, you don't do it to get results in that sense, you do it as a process of change. Even if you only nudge things a millimetre in the right direction and if you stop things going back, 
that's really important and I think over the next decade or so our main job is going to be to stop things getting worse. Now it's like it's it's more like you are dealing with a super concentrated high level industrial state that has all kinds of uh, ways of spying and sabotaging you but still the basic communication person to person the problems of bad housing the problems of bad health the problems of police violence the problems of um, social injustice they may have a different form but they're not different problems young people are powerful because they haven't got the uh, live, you know haven't had their wings clipped I'm not being taught to be safety first but at the same time, you also need people to have critical faculty and be able to, to, to um, spread that idea that you need to do things, you need to be active and perhaps make mistakes rather than try and get it perfect and make the ultimate success. I mean, there's no such thing as the internet when we were fighting. I mean, that would have been amazing. You know, I mean, there was, forget social media, there wasn't even a phone, you know. I mean, you had to put four pennies in a bloody machine, you know. Uh, so like when the carnival, the first carnival in Victoria Park, you know, we were in Trafalgar Square, you know, Roger Huddle was in, in Victoria Park and he was worried it wasn't happening and we couldn't communicate. We didn't, he didn't realise that there was 100,000 people on their way. I couldn't phone them to tell them, they're all coming, mate. You know, we had to communicate with posters. Posters was our big thing. Posters, word of mouth, music press. You know, when there were demonstrations, I believe it's really important that there should be posters about it. It shouldn't just be on the internet because people who see it on the internet are people that know where to look. Whereas if you see a poster, it's on the street and you just come across it because that is actually taking over space. Now you just whip off a tweet or an email and you can mobilize mass movements. But what I divine with some of that is sometimes it's easy to throw up a very quick movement around an issue, but it's difficult to sustain it. Social media increasingly encloses people in bubbles that they are not themselves um, constructing. It's difficult to talk to the people who didn't even know that this was a thing to think about. It's really important for successful activism that activists don't just talk to each other. The really important key to activist success is talking to the wider public. It may be that you can articulate yourself across space so you can create international movements in a, way, in a way which was very difficult to do in previous times. But Garvey's movement, the Pan-Africanist movement, liberation movements were international movements. People learned from each other's struggles. So it's not new, but it's much more easier now with modern forms of communication. I would say to, to young people that are starting off, and if they've got beliefs um, about climate change or about you know, the horrors of what the refugees are going through, they should make work about that and, and find, use different methods. It's no point in knowing something if you then can't see a way forward and doing something. The fact that we were well known for backing up our claims with eyewitnesses, research, statistics, that immediately got us taken much more seriously than an earlier generation of LGBT groups. I think you should not be too distressed about the way in which the mainstream media distort what you say. Always have faith in the intelligence of your audience because audiences are looking for clues that fit with their own conception of the world. And if you truly believe that your message is a message for, the, for everybody, it's about making life better for everybody, then if you find the right way to put that message out, it will connect with the people who you're trying to speak to. Be prepared for the long haul. Be prepared to sustain the campaigns over the months and years. I always like collaborating with people. It's really important. That this notion of forming coalitions was part of how we were doing our community organizing and our political organizing because all of these are grassroots organizations without, without a lot of money, without a lot of budget, but have a tremendous, what do you call it, a tremendous communal support because they're actually talking about the needs of people who are kind of left out of the political system. Get out there and join whatever 
campaigning is because you then learn, well, why am I doing this? And then you'll meet other people who go, you're a complete wanker. You know, I, I believe X, Y, and Z. You believe ABC, you know. Then you've got to argue your point. Well, this is why I believe ABC. But it is nevertheless that activity that gives you the knowledge and above all else, the biggest thing in all politi political activity, I think, is confidence. And it gives you the confidence to think, yeah, I might be able to do this. If we can't cope with working together with people that we believe are on the same side, what chances are of bringing about peace in the world, is what I tell myself. Um, so it, it is hard, but it's part of that important process. Don't waste your time going through establishment channels. They know how to fob you off and they'll keep you busy with what I call a paper trail. And you'll be in your 90s before you see anything happen. Get out on the streets, organise yourselves well. There's no need for violence. The kind of direct action that I've been inspired by is that of Mahindras Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Non-violent direct action and civil disobedience. You know, everyone has ideas. I've got a great idea. I do. Fucking ideas are irrelevant unless you manifest them. Activity can be, can be frightening, can be difficult. I've been scared out of my wits many, many times. Whether it works, whether it's bad times or good times, that accumulation of activity gives you such an amazing knowledge about what's possible and what isn't against the odds. Because you're pretty much always against the odds, aren't you? Backlash was actually quite personal. What was important was that we absolutely knew that, that things needed changing and we were going to change it. Hopefully, you'll win some quick short-term gains, but maybe not as much as you would like and deserve. The change that really matters is the change that happens inside people's heads and the way they think about how the world should be. And political activism, a lot of it is about changing the narrative, changing the way people think about themselves. We have to assume that every critic and every opponent is a potential friend and ally. The idea, the objective is not to um, score points, but to address issues of concern that will help those people who do not currently support you rethink their stance and eventually come over to your side. The concept of radicalisation assumes a passive subject being influenced by evil. I think most people who become involved in politics radicalise themselves. They they become radical because of because the world is changing and because they want to be part of it. So you still have to band together, have a commitment, challenge the authorities, risk your life and put everything on the line to make the world better. No government initiates change because they've maintained the status quo. They've got into power, so they're about to, you know. They're... But it's only by the actions of ordinary people all through the centuries, really, that initiate that beginning of change. At each stage, when they've made it more difficult for us to take action, whether it's more security or more change of bylaws so that we don't know where we are, or the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, I am just so certain that any campaign in the past, any campaign, it went on for a number of years, that at any one time, the people involved felt that nobody supported them, they were a small minority, and that they didn't know when they were going to be successful. So if we don't do what we feel we can do now, we, it might be just that little bit that eventually is what's needed to bring about that change. There's no single answer for everyone. No single, this is the way to do it for everyone. It depends who you are, what your circumstances are, what your concerns are, uh, uh, where your engagements are, uh, but uh, the opportunities are enormous and each individual just has to answer that question. How am I going to use the opportunities available to me to deal with the critical problems of the world?